The King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents The Broadcasters Podcast Where we dive deep into the media industry headlines And dissect the digital disruption that diverges the masses Into the new media culture culture And away from the media establishment Here is the King of Podcasts This is episode 204 of the Broadcasters Podcast Thanks for being here we're going to go through a lot of different things tonight. When it comes to iHeart Media and iHeart Podcast Network, iHeart Radio, which, as we know, their podcast division is one of the more prominent things they have underneath the iHeart Radio banner, a company that is still very much in the red, even after bankruptcy, but they've been allowed to go and continue to move along as they want, which, no surprise to me at all, but that's where they're going to do, and that's what they're able to go and do. So, good for them. Anyways, we're going to talk about them tonight here on the program because of the fact that the team there that has been working under their management has been fed up. They're deciding, most likely, just like any other reason, to unionize themselves. They're probably not getting paid what they think they should. They're probably not getting the benefits. They're probably not getting what their radio brethren are doing on the terrestrial radio side. And with that said, with the kind of money that's probably being brought in through podcasting because of the ad representation that iHeartRadio is able to bring on board for their podcast content and maybe some of the deals they do to get content available to be advertised with live reads, maybe they're not getting a good big enough cut. Or the staff that's putting this all together I mean, well, the stars are getting quite a bit of the take, but then it's the staff that's getting the shaft, literally that way. But we're going to get into that tonight because they have signed union cards to organize with the Writers Guild of America. And I didn't know if we'd get to this point, but look at that. Podcasting such a big deal that we're now getting to unionization here. And I thought we weren't going to hear about unions anymore after the strike in Hollywood or the the almost strike in Hollywood that was quelled uh, about a month ago. Now, I don't know if the, the whole deal, well, the ra- deal was more or less ratified. Remember that. But here we are. It's, you know, we have you know, a lot of things going on. The Great Resignation, where people are, you know, if they're being brought into the office, the feelings about COVID, and the fact that, you know, do people want to go back into work, go back into the office? Is there still a bit of a scare of going back in? And also, feeling like going back into what they were used to before and saying, well, we don't have to be working in the office. Who knows what all the story is? We're going to read about that next. But, you know, I know in my own case, I am king of podcasts for a reason. I'm doing this since 2005. Now, I have a radio podcast network. I don't know when that was officially launched. Unofficially. Podcasting became very prominent to iHeartMedia in 2016. Originally, they had a talk radio feature called iHeartRadio Talk, featuring on-demand programming for somebody like Ryan Seacrest and allowed users to upload their own content through Spreaker, which was owned by Vox. And that's now iHeartRadio now owns Spreaker as a platform. Then iHeartRadio's talk feature was rebranded to shows and personalities, and then in 2016, it simply became targeted as podcasts. And as we know, as a corporate company would, like iHeartMedia would do, they decided to go ahead and start adding on to what they were doing. Decided to go and start acquiring other podcasters and other podcast content. So when you go through and you look at iHeartMedia in September 2018 acquired Stuff Media, which was the leading U.S. for profit publisher of entertaining and informative podcast content, the How Stuff Works podcasting business division, and its later premium podcast content, $55 million. And they have also put on their own shows, and the iHeartRadio podcast network now hosts more than 750 iHeartRadio original shows, including the Wrong Burgundy podcast, Stuff You Should Know, Disgraceland, and Chelsea Handler's Life Will Be the Death of Me. And they have been expanding themselves. They went in the Canada 2016. They are now in Puerto Rico and Mexico, among other things. 
October 2020, they acquired Voxness. And they also bought Triton, Triton Original from Scripps, which is an advertising arm. So they've done all this and they put themselves together because for themselves, even though they're the largest radio broadcaster, 850 local stations across the U.S., 100 stations from other various media, and 250,000 podcasts, the money they're making now to support iHeartMedia is the podcast division. On demand as opposed to live and local, which is not even live and local anymore. So next I want to take the story from Radio Television Business Report. Some 125 members working in the iHeart Podcast Network have been encouraged to embrace the dynamism of startup culture without any of the associated benefits. So they're saying that iHeart Media was handling the podcasting like it would a startup company without any benefits. Now, granted, I work for a small business and I have to go work on my own benefits. I'm not part of a big company. And, you know, for full disclosure, I did work for iHeart Media when it was Clear Channel Radio. And I missed iHeart Media by a couple of years. But I followed along and I have enough people that I know in the business and I followed iHeartRadio for a long time to know what's going on here. Especially if you know me on this program, I've talked about it. So with that said, they assigned union cards to organize with the Writers Guild of America. And the Writers Guild, WJE, has called on management to voluntarily recognize the union. The corporate for iHeartMedia had no comment on the matter as of yet, but I do have that. I'll give that to you in a minute. Podcast Business Journal asked the Writers Guild for specific names behind the letter. The co-owned publication to Radio TV Business Report was told it was attributed to the iHeart Podcast Union. Now, in the latest earnings call for the third quarter, CEO Bob Pittman had said, the podcast division is profitable for the company. $156 million in podcast revenue through the first nine months of 2021. Now, this union that's being formed it is called the iHeart Podcast Network Bargaining Committee. It includes producers, editors, researchers, writers, and hosts based in Atlanta, Los Angeles, and New York City. Now, as you know, you know I'm not anywhere where I'm dealing with unions myself. I don't have that worry because I do have creative control, and I you know, get to do quite a bit when it comes to helping to bring content together instead of that corporate format. So... I know exactly what these people are doing because I do their job every day. Okay. When they're talking about producing, editing, researching, writing, and hosting, I do all of them. For my podcast, for two podcast networks that are going to run full time, cannabisradio.com, WMR.fm. Those are mine. You want to know my background? You want to know my credentials? kingofpodcasts.com is my portfolio. Everything you need to know about me right there is there. And if you want somebody that's non-unionized and wants somebody to help counsel and help you build your own podcast, then go reach out to me, kingofpodcasts.com. But anyway, my background speaks for itself. So I can absolutely speak on this subject. Now, here's the letter that the union wrote to management. Very curious what they say. We, the podcast producers, editors, researchers, writers, and hosts of iHeartMedia, are thrilled to announce we are unionizing with the Writers Guild of America East. Months of our discussion with our colleagues have clarified some things. First, we love to create the community we have created at iHeart. We work shoulder to shoulder with some of the most creative minds of the business who have come to feel more like family. We're devoted and passionate storytellers who take pride in our ability to provide our listeners with entertaining, thought-provoking audio content, and most importantly, companionship. Now, they say that during difficult times, the whole uh, iHeart Digital Audio Group prides itself on relative autonomy and adapting to shift the needs of the marketplace, much like a startup, working under the capacity constraints of a legacy broadcast conglomerate. We've been encouraged, essentially, to embrace the dynamics of the startup culture without any of the associated benefits. So what they want now, and I'm sure they probably tried to negotiate, was they want to be treated like the radio team, which we already know what the radio team, and this is what they don't understand is that if they decide to go ahead, and I don't know how many of these folks are full-time employees, but you run the sacrifice that if unionization is going to happen, you know, I think I know very well what iHeartMedia would do. 
you know, if they had to go and offer benefit packages and offer better pay, then they're just going to just unload people or they're going to contract, you know, this out to somebody else and get somebody else to handle it. They're not going to worry about this staff unionizing. I understand the move because it's everybody consolidated to go make this move. So I heard me they could do a couple of things. You know, I always thought that if they wanted to keep themselves where they were, they should have unloaded iHeartMedia about five years ago. When podcasting was coming into play, somebody else should have come in. But, of course, Bob Pittman says, you know, podcasting is our birthright. Well, those words are coming back to bite you, Bob, because your team, now I know you're just a figurehead, but the brass there that decided, you know, the, honestly, the venture capital, you know, they me the adventures, the uh, private ventures, okay, the private equities, they're the ones that said, no, no, we're going to keep you on board. And now what are they going to do about this? They're not going to respond well to this. They're going to basically say, you know what? We could unload this issue. We could keep doing our content with somebody else, relatively just change everybody out keep the staff on that we have, the people that are contracted that are our hosts, keep them there and just switch out. Now, at this point, no one has decided to go ahead and jump ship, which is the other thing I'm surprised by, that certain podcasters that were out there, they didn't decide to go and say, you know what, we should move along. But they should have known. Once their companies were bought by iHeart, yeah, you know what's going to happen with that. I mean, you know, if it was me, I know what would happen with that. God forbid if Cannabis Radio or or anybody else, you know, if we have a corporate entity that decides to buy us, listen, I understand it and I appreciate good business, but I would be skeptical about what would happen. And I would want to make sure that, you know, first of all, job security. Second of all, if they're going to put me in this, you know, put me in a management position because you want me to be, you know, enough to understand and delegate and to be able to be offering leadership. But then also be able to say, okay, we need somebody to have a good mind about trying to handle the business, but also play nice with corporate. Just to go fully corporate here takes away what podcasting is supposed to be because the reason they're seeing startup culture is because podcasting is built on a different culture. They're not doing traditional radio. And at one point, I thought traditional radio could still work in this space probably about 10 years ago i learned that lesson uh, and i've learned it's just changed a lot what we learn in podcasting is that things have changed from the streaming in of over the top platforms on how we see your video and we see youtube content are the attention span and what needs to be done for my own programming i i keep myself to a certain time limit i don't try to go along and I'm not pussyfooting around and talking about myself all the time, unless it's relevant to the conversation like it is today. But I try to keep my content in an hour, almost everything. One of my podcasting series, I keep it between 10 and 20 minutes. But an hour for this program, as much as I can, unless there's something absolutely got to get in for the week, I'll do that. And I'll make sure to go ahead and make my point across and keep to the subject I stick to the subject. I put out a podcasting one one series on TikTok and Instagram, 30 episodes. You want to go look for it? At King of Podcasts. And I'll tell you, I stick to what my rules are and what I tell, what I counsel the show hosts to do content for my shows, for the shows that I run on these networks. You know, we're collaborating. We're working together. I'm working with paid. We're working with clients. We're working with those that are collaborating with us, experts in their field, luminaries in the industry whether it's tech, whether it's cannabis, whether it's whatever. So for us, the startup culture is exactly what this is because startup culture for the content that I do is startup. Because we'll talk about, at least for me on Cannabis Radio, we have a lot of startups out there, a lot of the corporate culture as well, and a ever-changing industry. Same thing with tech since 2005. So we keep an eye on all of this. And there's a lot of startups in there. And the fact that iHeart acquired all these different channels, all these different podcasts, all these different things, 
there are certain shows that are probably run at a very professional standpoint from the beginning because you probably had them like the Chelsea Handlers and the Will Ferrells of the world. Their shows must be heavily produced and very corporately controlled because of the money that's being invested on those shows. Maybe not so much investing on it because I'm guessing Will Ferrell and Chelsea Handler probably come in and probably get something on the back end with some base kind of a contract agreement for the shows that they produce. But if they're getting sponsorships, they're getting live reads, they're getting you know, whatever kind of revenue that's coming back in and a certain amount towards them, yeah, they're probably getting something on the back end. Unless you are Joe Rogan that's getting $100 million for multiple years to do it on Spotify. Because he's also bringing in so many sponsors with them. Meanwhile, if you look at who they brought over in these other shows, iHeart Media is controlling the advertising altogether. It's not like you're just bringing on people that are on board. If they were on these said shows before, then that's on iHeart Media because they control everything. They like to control the content, the equipment, the advertising platform, the promotional platform. They want to control everything. That's what they want. Okay. Moving along into this letter that was written to management. In the last two years, unprecedented intelligence, we managed to seamlessly transition to remote work. Our adaptability helped the company not just sustain, but thrive a period of economic uncertainty and social unrest. During team calls, town halls, and official email communications from leadership, we were frequently reminded of the financial gains we helped make possible. So yeah, when Bob Pittman is bragging about earnings calls and bragging about podcasting or whatever venue he can go to, NAB, podcast movement, whatever. Yeah, he does all that. Those gains have not, unfortunately, reached the creators working around the clock to keep our audience of more than 30 million monthly listeners actively engaged. Yep. Trickle down. They're not getting paid after all this is going on. So yeah, where's our cut? That's a corporate mentality. When you are in a corporate structure like that, then you have to worry about yourself like you do. It's not about the creative creativity anymore. It's not about the content anymore. It's about getting paid for doing what you need to do. So it's not even going to be above and beyond for these folks. Maybe some of them do. I'm not going to put everybody under the bus, but I'm sure there's some people just like in that iHeart Media umbrella that people will do the bare minimum for what they are paid for. So they'll do their job, but only their job and nothing more, nothing less. Exactly what they are required to do by management to get their job done. And that's all they're going to do. Which is why I don't like that uh, kind of format, but that's what they're going to do anyway. With hundreds of shows across all categories and genres, many of us are doing the work of multiple employees. The huge volume of content we are responsible for is not met with equitable compensation. Okay. You know, this is where I don't, you know, they talk about this. Kids, you know, my my brethren in the iHeart Podcast Network. Okay. At one point, I actually managed and produced and edited and hosted. I didn't host all these shows. But I managed to produce and edited 45 to 50 shows at any given time. We really had that many before. We had more than, no, actually, what was it? uh, Yeah, we had two dozen sponsors. We had a nice audience going. We were going to multiple conferences regularly. You know, the, the most amount of people I had in my outfit doing this? In the production division. I'm not talking about sales. I'm not talking about promotion. I'm not talking about administrative. I'm not talking about assistance to the management. Okay? Just in production. All right? And this is me bragging because, yeah, it was a small staff, but because that's because I handled everything myself. I never had more than three people underneath my wing or working alongside me as a senior producer or as the program directors for both networks. I don't know what they're all doing here that's making it so hard. Also, they're doing weekly programs. Okay? 
plus those programs. And for the last nine years myself, I have been doing two programs weekly, producing, editing, hosting, promoting, all of it. This program right here, I'm the only person doing this show. That's it. Booking, scheduling guests, prepping, you know, uh, prepping the hosts, writing up their outlines, sometimes having to write the scripts for these hosts down word for effing word. That's what I did. That's what I still do now. And I'm happy about it and I enjoy it. But the thing is, I couldn't do it in the corporate era and, and, and the corporate run. Because you know what's happening? I guarantee that most of these people in this iHeart Podcast Network, they're not even making as much as I am. You know that? Because also startup culture, if you're really talking about startup culture, then you have to realize that you have to have other work to manage a decent income to live off of. A real living wage. So you can't expect podcasting in this realm from a company like iHeartMedia to pay your bills. Ask your terrestrial radio brethren, the ones that are not under contracts and not having, they don't have agents and not have been the ones that have been around since before Clear Channel took this over and truly made this corporate. All right. Before 1996, the pre-1996 Telecommunications Telecommunication Act folks, talk to them. Right, those are the ones that were smart that stayed on contracts and were able to keep themselves with a good, decent deal, getting good sponsorships, and they were able to hold on to a good amount of their payment. But then after that, what else did you have? All right, you got to ask yourself. I mean, what were you thinking you were going to make off of this? What you need to do is you're not going to make this a normal corporate structure. You're not going to create this employment environment where you're going to get benefits you know, for mental health wellness. You're going to get medical, dental. You're going to get a 401k plan. I don't expect you getting any of that. And maybe that's just not what they're doing in this network division. And the cost it's going to put on iHeartMedia on their end, which I don't care for, but I'm going to say at least this, you know how much money that's going to cost them to incorporate the next year, 100 plus people, you understand, 100 plus people, you know, iHeartMedia is accustomed to releasing that many people in a year, all right? I mean, how many times have we seen where iHeartMedia has laid off, I mean, they laid off so many during pandemic, and they've continued to downsize. What makes you so special? What makes you think that you're going to be able to stand above what's going on? Now, I respect the fact you want to unionize, and I respect the fact of what you're doing for yourselves in terms of creating, creating content, okay? I probably don't listen to your content, but I respect the fact you do it and that you are able to put out, and there's a lot of people, there's a lot, like you said, 30 million listeners. Hey, I respect the fact you do it. And I bet you some of you are probably taking this time off, but meanwhile, you're still the king of podcasts. December, I'm not taking a day off, Okay. I'm still doing content, probably Christmas Day and New Year's, well, not New Year's Eve, but I'm going to be working Uber New Year's Eve and probably Christmas Day. But we got, what, three weeks left of the year? And I'll tell you something, Wrestling is Real Podcast, Broadcasters Podcast, I got shows I'm going to be doing all the way through. My Blunt Business Program, I'm doing Cannabis Radio, I already recorded new content. Two new episodes to run the week of Christmas and New Year's because that's how much I care. I'm not even doing best of content. I'm, rec- I'm predicting on the future of cannabis, 2022. So it's new content. I don't stop. All right. And then I went on my podcasting series. I, I already record that in bulk because a lot of it's timeless. And I'm already booked into January. I get shit done. And I work damn hard to do it. And so for those that feel like unionizing is the right move, you're going you're gonna to get burned. I, I really don't have to. I really hope that doesn't happen to you. But I know what this company has been like, the reputation. Now, don't get me wrong. I had two years full-time and two years part-time with this company. And, you know, I was able to get into this company in and out without scathing. Okay. And I had good people I got to work with. All right. And for the most part, I didn't have any issues with the likes of John Hunt, Dave Denver, Brian Mudd, Steve Nickel, 
John Manzo, Chris Marino, Andy Preston, rest in peace. Among the rest of the stuff that was there, because don't get me wrong, in the radio division, there's good people. And I'm sure there's some good people here producing. But I don't know if I would ever work for iHeartRadio in the podcast division if I was offered. I don't think I could do it. Because I know that corporate environment. If you're doing podcasting in a radio format, and you you got to remember this too, folks. iHeartMedia, your corporate team there, I mean, maybe Bob Pittman, you know, he worked at MTV, but let's just keep this in point. You're working with a sales staff. You're working with a team there in the corporate and on the very top of San Antonio, Miami, uh, Atlanta, wherever the regional directors are, that they're at the behest of sales. They care about how much they can sell. They're not radio people. And at the same time, they're not radio people. They're not podcasting people. Okay, it took even a while for a radio company like iHeartRadio to realize podcasting was the future. And if they were not able to go ahead and do what they could to create separate revenue streams out of online streaming and their live terrestrial streaming or live terrestrial radio, their AM FMs, they couldn't get that figured out right. What makes you think they're going to get this right? I mean, they're making money off of here. Because they have all this national advertising that they already have to do is make goods on all these other radio stations, their AM and FMs, and their streaming. And then podcasting, those same ads go in there too with local ads. But the sell for those advertisers now, the draw is podcasting. It's what you're doing right now. And you know what it is, too? I heart many of probably doesn't even care what, how good the content is. As long as it generates downloads, they don't give a shit what it is. That's really what they think. I'm sure of it. I've been removed from that company for a while now. But I know enough about how that company works and how that works. And if you know corporate, like I do, I've been ramping on it. That was the reason I called this show had the word corporate in it. Because I was not happy about it. And that's the ongoing thing of the digital disruption. Okay. iHeartMedia with this podcast network was trying to embrace the digital disruption. And then what happens now? Hmm? Yep. You see what happens. They'll take the money that comes in for the digital disruption, but they already sacrificed a terrestrial radio division. They've already, you know, brought it down to bare bones. And actually, I'm surprised that there's that many people in the iHeartMedia podcast network in the first place. 125 employees? That's actually kind of big. I actually thought it would have been less. And I'm going to tell you something. They're going to think they can do it with less. So those that decide to unionize, go right ahead. But they're going to make you expendable. They're going to let you go. There's, they're not going to let everybody go. They've got to have people that can actually run it. But more people are going to take on more work. And this right now puts you at risk of doing it. Now, I don't say don't unionize, but know the risks. Know what you're getting themselves into. The same thing, and I'm going to tell you, listen to what I said a few weeks ago about the Association of Motion Picture and Television Producers, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Just look back at what happened with them unionizing. <clears throat> uh, understand when the Writers Guild, this same guild, when they had the issues with the Association of Talent Agents and the deal being made there. So that union decided to bring them off of uh, the talent agents. But then that means you were being left on your own. If you want to do that, you want to risk yourself at that. I don't expect other groups to do this. But the other thing, too, is that what has this done for Vice Network? Remember when they were in the unionize? Remember when that happened? Let me quote the Hollywood Reporter, September 11th of this year. Vice been in union to top executives because they were laying off staffers. And the severance for those staffers they deemed, quote, unconscionable, end quote. 
A former member of the Vice Union telling Hollywood Reporter, it's really painful, quote, to see how the company has handled this time. Learn from your peers, ladies and gentlemen. Vice a while back unionized. A letter was sent to top executives, including the Vice CEO, Nancy Dubuque, and the Labor Management Committee had, committee had ad requested to increase severance from six to eight weeks to nine to 12 weeks for former staffers. And this big corporate group, unwilling. Also, the union didn't like the fact that the Vice was receiving $135 million of new funding a week after they did layoffs. Because Vice had planned to cut 55 staffers in the U.S. and 100 abroad, and they were unionized. Mm -hmm. This will be the future. And, you know, it's unfortunate, but podcasting cannot be run like radio. It will not be run like television. It will not be done like music. I don't think a corporate aspect necessarily works well for podcasting and let's just be honest most even though we have a lot of podcasts that are out there in your top 30 or whatever of apple podcasts that are corporate all right there's something to be said about how npr does it as far as i know i don't think npr has unionization but they're government run it's a different story and npr is the best out there they're the ones at the tops of everything on most areas Meanwhile, other companies, other media entities have their own podcasts and they do what they're going to do. By the way, top podcast publishers, let's put it like this too. Okay, High Heart Radio is top. But what other corporate companies are doing that? Okay, NPR, government run. Wondery, which is a smaller firm. New York Times. Walt Disney, which is a big corporate uh, entity, but they're doing ESPN and ESPN's reputation. You know, they also do ESPN radio. To be honest, they do a pretty good job themselves of doing their own podcast content. NBC News, PRX, Barstool Sports, Daily Wire, and the Cumulus Podcast Network. Cumulus is well down the list. So you can do that all you want if you decide to go this route. If this is something that you think is the right decision, bless you, Godspeed. I hope for the best. Now, I want to take from a couple of the stories about the story here. WGA's executive director, Lowell Peterson, said, quote, We are pleased to welcome the storytellers at iHeart Podcast Network to the Guild. A union is vital to ensuring podcast workers are able to build sustainable careers and in an industry where their contributions have been essential to the sector's continued rapid growth. You, you know, just change it to any other industry, okay? We're pleased to welcome, you know, the producers, directors, gaffers at said company, Paramount Pictures. Union is vital to ensuring, you know, Stage workers are sustainable careers. Sectors continue rapid growth. It's the same thing. Now, keep in mind, there's also big deals that are still coming in that are being brought up in terms of what they're doing. Now, they are doing this at other companies. I don't want to just said iHeartMedia is notorious for this, but there have been other companies. That's what Deadline reports here. WGA also represents workers at podcast production companies Gimlet Media, The Ringer, and Parcast, all of which were recognized voluntarily by owner Spotify. Gimlet and The Ringer ratified their first collective bargaining agreement earlier this year. Parcast is negotiating its first contract. Their demands as this union is being formed, quote, is number one, appropriate compensation of benefits. Two, accountability mechanisms regarding diversity and inclusion efforts. Three, manageable workloads and appropriate staffing for shows. Four, clear paths for advancement and standardized job descriptions. Five, job security. I wouldn't sign up for that. There's enough small podcasters, some enough entrepreneurs out there 
that are able to do what they need to do to get themselves out there and, and make good money. And I know enough of those out there where there's also independent content creators and those that even decide to go and adapt into working on you know, their own podcast, whether they're influencers, whether they're people that came from YouTube deciding to go and just move over. There's a lot of ways to make yourself money if you can get the audience and sustain a very good living if you want. Now, the funny part is they say that iHeart's leadership voluntarily recognized our union. They asked for it. And they can ensure that iHeart's growth remains sustainable and they retain our position as an industry leader. You know what? What's going to happen is they're going to make money without you. I really think that's what's going to happen. I would not be surprised that sometime next year we will see layoffs. There's enough evidence out there to support it. Let me take from Bloomberg that also talked about this. iHeartMedia did not respond to the response from an inquiry. Uh, Streaming music, uh, which is uh, content, has been heard by 9 out of 10 Americans each month, they say. Immersion bankruptcy in 2019 returned to the public markets. Bloomberg LP announced plans and made a co-produce and distribute audio series with iHeartMedia. Also, Brian Grazer and Ron Howard of Imagine Entertainment also put a deal together to go ahead along, launching an audio vision and striking a podcast deal with iHeartMedia. So all these new deals coming in, who's going to handle this? All the money coming in. I mean, what they should do is iHeart should be handling the distribution rights for all these companies, but they're owning them. They should let them be set off and provide themselves as the exclusive distributor and take their cut of the ad revenue and barter off. Like it should be run separately. I don't know. There was a way where uh, premier media networks, which is the arm uh, major talk arm for, iHeartMedia that works well. I mean, but they don't have this the same idea set up here, which is what should have happened. I mean, Premier Radio should have taken over as the podcast division, but iHeart Radio and the app that was built, they decided to put it there. And so under that leadership is where we are here. Now here's a little bit of information about the labor laws. It will the U.S. labor laws allow companies to recognize and negotiate with the union as soon as it has signed up a majority of the employees. If the business doesn't voluntarily recognize them, writer, workers can ask the government to schedule an election. Labor board election process can mean weeks of legal wrangling over topics as which workers should be eligible to vote. Time companies often use to campaign against unionization. That's the other part. So they're trying to get their union cards all set together. But I heart could very well say you know what we're not going to recognize you guys i would not be surprised if they chose to do that i would not be surprised in the least if they chose to do that it would suck but that's what they would get now the media industry has seen a number of successful organizing efforts in recent years wga east represents digital journalists at outlets such as huffpost and vice media also, securing selective collective bu- secured so collective bargaining agreements, like I said, for the folks at Spotify, Ringer, and Gimlet Media brands. There also there's a campaign with the iHeart Media strike authorizations and sorts of on all sorts of sectors, and an organizing campaign at Starbucks Corporation where employee ballots are due to be counted Thursday afternoon. iHeartMedia workers said they began talking to WJE staff last year, organized in earnest for the past few months. Joelle Smith, an executive producer, said she and other employees previously worked in online writing jobs and witnessed the disruptions of this place on the staff there in recent years. Because, quote, so many people have come from that landscape, we're more on guard about making sure we're protected, end quote. Beware. Be careful for what you wish for. 
because you might just get it. And what you're going to get will not be what you think it's supposed to be. Okay? It's not fair. Sure, it's not. But you're talking about iHeartMedia here. They're going to try to get away with what they can. This is not a completely forward-thinking, progressive media company. This is a company with still more than $6 billion in debt run by a private equity firm after another private equity firm made back their money and interest on the company and said, you know what? You guys have it, right? That's how it works. I hope, hey, if it works for you, God bless. But I don't think how it's going to work for you is going to be very well. If that's what you decide to do, go right ahead. I want to follow up on a story that I talked about, of course, the Travis Scott Astro World trial or the Astro World incident. And Travis Scott sat down for a 50 minute interview with Charlemagne the God on the Breakfast Club's host YouTube channel. So let's go into what he actually says. Charlemagne asked Scott what he knew and when about the crowd crush at the Houston concert that ultimately left 10 people dead and many more injured. Quote, I didn't know the exact details until minutes before the press conference after the concert. And even at the moment, you're kind of like, wait, what? People pass out. Things happen at concerts, but something like that. End quote. He added before trailing off. When Charlamagne asked if he had heard people shouting help whenever he stopped performing, Scott he didn't hear, said he didn't hear any of those screams. Quote, Anytime you can hear something like that, too, you want to stop the show. You want to make sure fans get the proper attention they need. And anytime I could see anything like that, I did. I stopped a couple times to make sure everybody was okay. And I really just go off the fans' energy as a collective call and response. I just didn't hear that. He explained the large crowd, lights, pyrotechnics, and the music in his band made it hard for him to see exactly what was happening in the audience. Quote, you can only help what you see and whatever you're told. In terms of communication Scott received from security about what happened in the crowd during his set, he said he was simply told that. Quote, once the guests get off the stage, we're going to end the show, and that's what they did. Other than that, there was no other communication. No communication on why. That's what came through my ears, end quote. When he was asked about how, what he'd tell families of those lost, well, the lost loved ones at the event, he said, quote, I'd say to them that I'm always here. And then I'm in this with you guys, and I love you, and I'll always be there to help you heal through this. I understand what they're going through. They're grieving right now, and it's not just a right now thing. It's a forever thing. And these people that came to the show, they are my family, and I've always had that connection to other people. That he hopes, also says, uh, paraphrasing, that he hopes people can prevent things like this from happening in the future. Quote, I really want to figure this out, not take this lightly and really act on it. They've got to act on it and it just can't be like something that just happens and they just roll over. It's got to be something that's taken serious and addressed seriously. So this was probably put together to kind of really just save face. Damage control. I can appreciate that. He has to rehabilitate his career. This is what he's doing with Shalom and the God. I'll take a couple stories on the movies streaming TV front. Uh, first of all, Universal Movies are not going to debut on Peacock 45 days after the release. So everybody going back to normal. We're going to have now actual theater releases once again, where the movie theaters, the box office, will actually get to go and run their exhibition window as such, like just like it was before 2019. And they're going to be able to go ahead and all these over-the-top platforms, HBO Max, Paramount Plus, all of them, Peacock, they're all going to run their movies later. No more simultaneous. Basically, Matrix Resurrections will be the last one that will probably get this kind of window. Simultaneous. Unless you're a Netflix movie, that'll put something on a limited release just to get some hype. Interesting story I saw late last week after I recorded the show from Deadspin.com. 
Sports has have a, a Gen Z problem, and it could take some experimenting to fix. So the Major League Baseball and NFL could take some notes from eSports on engagement. Because live sports, of course, we know people are still watching very much on network and cable television. That's all that's really getting any kind of audience, if any, especially football. There was a survey of general Gen Z Americans revealing in 2020 that only 53% considered themselves sports fans and only 21% considered themselves to be avid sports fans. And the figures are the lowest of any age demographic. Gen Z has shown a general, general disinterest towards professional sports, with more of their interest being directed towards readily available entertainment such as eSports and other streaming op- options like Twitch, Netflix, and YouTube. According to the survey, there are only a few sports that have not fallen off in terms of fandom and the, cre- the increase in Gen Z consumers. 45% of American adults consider themselves to be NBA fans. 47% are Gen Zers. The only other sport to not experience a drop-off in fandom is the UFC. Every other traditional sport, though, has seen drops. Major League Baseball has fallen from 50% of adults to 32% of Gen Z. NFL, 59 to 49%. NHL, 38 to 25%. Now, they said COVID might have played a role in the decrease of traditional sports, but no live sports on TV. Young people turn to other forms of entertainment, specifically video games, whether it be playing themselves or watching others. So, we got to see if there's anything changes after this and see what it does. However, uh, one of the things that was very popular among Gen Z is Twitch. And it got massive growth since the start of 2020, much like TikTok, much like OnlyFans, because of its wide array of available content at a time when much not much of the content was available. But however, it was not just Twitch's content that drew in Gen Z viewers, it's also interactivity. Now, that's been spoke with uh, Associate Professor of Communication at Maryville University in St. Louis, Dustin York. And he said the lack of interactivity in sports is one of the biggest issues and the main thing driving Gen Z consumers towards platforms like Twitch. <clears throat> the question is, how can sports become more experiential? The billion dollar question. How can college or pro sports provide the same sort of interactivity <clears throat> that video game streaming has been linked to? Now, I talk about how certain NFL teams of the Carolina Panthers and Baltimore Ravens have experimented with augmented reality in the past to create huge holographic animals in an attempt to engage with fans and audience and attendance. Now, the other thing I could tell you as well <clears throat> is you see some of the changes are being made with the way NFL is being shot. And you see that they're definitely trying to create that video game look to their program. When you're watching live football, when you see the touchdowns being made, you see the graphics look like something out of a video game. You see the aspect ratio where there's just a blur to the rest of the crowd <clears throat> and only a focus on the athlete that made the score and the teammate. So you see that part too. They're creating that whole kind of effect right there, which is exactly what you would see in a, all, in a, in a, in a NFL game, which is still quite popular. He brought up an idea of fan-controlled football leagues with fan engagement as the core principle. Fans who subscribe to the league will have the opportunity to call their favorite team's plays, decide the play however they want. Players on the field will run that play, almost like fans can be the coach, if only for one play out of an entire game. They also talk about the superstars and how they're marketed towards Gen Z and how there's probably a little bit of a disconnect on that front. Esports and especially streaming bring a new tra- aspect to consumable media. Fans can interact directly with whoever we're watching. While we get somewhat of the same feeling while scrolling through social media and responding to our favorite athletes' posts, we don't get that opportunity while watching them in action. Sounds like a small difference, but it's apparently enormous waves made among Gen Zers, and they're looking to see if their similar systems can be put in place for their favorite sports. Interesting story. Because we do need to worry about what are the younger listeners engaging with. Because you want to be able to create media that targets them. Because then the advertisers need to be able to target them as well. You got to think about that. Especially established brands. Like I do wrestling podcast, And we talk about WWE or World Wrestling Entertainment. 
and you look at all the things that are going on with them regularly. And they're trying to find the best way to adapt to what they're doing to a younger audience because their audience is getting older. The bulk of it is 50 years plus. They're not getting that targeted 18 to 49 demographic. They need to get more of those. So they have to figure out what to do so the next generation will still engage and still watch and still buy from their sponsors and all that. This story made the rounds, and I didn't get a chance to get to it, but New York Times talked about that one of their columns obtained an internal company document offering a new level of detail about the, how the algorithm works. There are four main goals for TikTok out, TikTok's algorithm. User value, long-term user value, creator value, and platform value. The document is headed TikTok Algo 101. Produced by TikTok's engineering team in Beijing. The authenticity was confirmed, by the way. A recent Wall Street Journal report demonstrated how TikTok relies heavily on how much time you spend watching a video to steer you towards more videos that will keep you scrolling. That process can sometimes lead young viewers down dangerous rabbit holes, in particular toward content that promotes suicide or self-harm. Problems with TikTok says it's working to stop by aggressively deleting content that violates its terms of service. And I noticed that algorithm. And so when I'm watching stuff on TikTok, you know, I will recognize how long I'm watching a particular video. And I feel like, you know, okay, I'm not going to sit through this because I know if I see another one of these videos, I don't want to watch it. So I'll find a way to go ahead and push myself out. The other thing I do as well is I might follow somebody a content creator on tiktok for a bit but then you know they put out so much content anyway and i'm already in the algorithm kind of train myself to watch so i'll just unfollow them so i'm only going to get their content so much but i'm not going to get it as heavy as some might give which is what i want i want variety i don't want the same content creators every time on my channel unless i want to go look for them not that i just keep popping up my for you page So there's two related metrics they worry about in the stream of videos it serves. Retention, whenever a user comes back and time spent. The app wants to keep you there as long as possible. The experience is sometimes described as an addiction, though it recalls a frequent criticism of pop culture. To analysts who believe algorithmic recommendations pose a social threat, the TikTok document confirms their suspicions. The system means they watch time is key. They want to get people addicted rather than giving them what they really want. Quote, I think it's a crazy idea to let TikTok's algorithm steer the life of our kids. This is according to Guillaume Chaslo, founder of Algo Transparency, a group based in Paris that has studied YouTube's recommendation system, taking a dark view on the effect of the product on children. TikTok gains a piece of information on him. In a few hours, the algorithm can detect his musical taste, his physical attraction. If he's depressed, he might be into drugs and many other sensitive information and a high risk that some of the information will be used against them. Okay. Well, I'll admit, you know, when I'm watching my For You page, yeah, I get the occasional thirst trap, and yeah, they're quite attractive. And I get some other content that does kind of lean more towards what I like, but I also want to make sure that I'm not getting the same content over and over. So I'll know more or less instinctively that I'm going to move on to the next video because, you know, when I've watched somebody... I can't just watch their videos over and over, especially if it's the same thing done over and over again. One-dimensional content creators, I can only take so much. That's why I got to change it up. But then again, the TikTok creators that are doing well, they're made to do content that is the same thing over and over and sticking to one subject. I mean, well, on my TikTok account, it's not that big at all because I don't do that. I like to do different content. I like variety. You know, when I, you know, I have two shows where I'm specific, but then my, one of my podcasting series is a hodgepodge to whatever else I want to talk about. That's besides the other two subjects. So I like having that default channel to talk about other things. There's that part. There's a whole lot more to it, but I'm going to leave, just leave it right there. 
I have one last story before I wrap things up here. And that's about how music listening is changing. Music listening behavior, particularly among Gen Z. This is from RadioWorld.com. A new survey commissioned by Dolby Labs finds that music listening behavior in the U.S. is changing among adults, particularly Gen Z. The survey was conducted by one poll in November 2021, polled 2,000 general population adults who regularly listen to music for at least one hour per day. They examined their listening behavior, purchase decisions, and habits formed form the, from the COVID-19 pandemic. In their findings, a number of respondents noted their music tastes weren't necessarily typical for their age group. Six and ten listeners feel like they were born in the wrong era because of their taste of music. Highest among Gen Z. For most, the era that most closely matches their taste of music was the 2000s. Almost half those polled recently discovered a song released over a decade ago, which was highest among Gen Z respondents, nearly 70%. If you notice what songs get popular and viral on TikTok, that very much happens. Most respondents, close to 70%, are embarrassed to share their music playlists with others, particularly their boss. Well, yeah, you know what? If I had to show my taste, because I looked at my Spotify Unwrapped and what happened there. Uh, let me look at what I put in here again, because I put that into my profile. And I'm sure people can go and crap on me for this, but, you know, I don't care. In my 2021 Wrapped, I listened to 25,324 minutes on Spotify. My top five artists, Bad Bunny, Dua Lipa, Justin Bieber, Olivia Rodrigo and Doja Cat going from five to one. So Doja Cat was my most listened to artist. Among the songs I listened to, Astronaut in the Ocean, Mass Wolf was number five. Peaches, Justin Bieber, Daniel Caesar and Giveon, number four. Olivia Rodrigo, Good For You, number three. Montero, Call Me By Your Name by Little Nas X, number two. And the number one song I listened to on Spotify all in 2021, Kiss Me More, Doja Cat for Shooting Scissor. There you go. I don't know if I really feel too embarrassed, I guess. Well, I kind of would be. But my music is my music. What can I say? Unsurprisingly, social media and Hollywood entertainment, entertainment, Hollywood entertainment heavily influenced the discovery of new music. Social media is the most significant influence shaping how people discover new music, while movies and TV shows play an equally important role. As we know, a lot of songs from Netflix... They influence the charts. All we got to do is just say Glass Animals Heat Waves. And how did that song from 2019 become a song resurrected as a song once again that was popular? Yep. Social media. A full 57% social media is on the top way they discover music. YouTube is the most popular platform for discovering music, according to the 79% survey. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok significantly influence how people find new songs. Almost a fourth of people who recently discovered a song released over a decade ago attributed this discovery to a viral video on social media. As for Hollywood's impact, six in ten have discovered a new song, artist or song, after watching a TV show or a movie. And many are prioritizing audio quality when enjoying music. When choosing a music streaming plan, music fans prioritize quality above all, especially Gen Z. Among those who pay for a music streaming plan like myself, nearly 90% agreed that enhanced audio quality is a must-have feature of the subscription, of which more than half strongly agreed. This group, 82% have upgraded, changed subscriptions, or explicitly paid for a service because it offered better audio quality. Nearly two-thirds who pay for a music streaming service subscription, subscription excuse me, indicated that better sound quality was more important than other features such as ad-free listening, exclusive content, or the ability to add multiple users to their account. And that's a lot right there. Very interesting. All of us fascinating. Okay. That's the show for tonight. I'm not even going to do part two of the year in media, but I guess I will be tabling that for it next week. So we're going to leave it there. Thanks for listening as you always do. Subscribing. Make sure you can review, like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube feed. If you're watching it on YouTube, thank you for checking out the show as you always do. If you listen to it on the podcast front, thank you for subscribing. Please share the word to uh, subscribe and learn about the show and really get engaged and involved. We'd love to hear from you as well. You can go to my website, King of Podcasts, 
podcasts.com. I got a contact form right there. Or email me, kingofpodcasts at yahoo.com if you feel so inclined. Thanks for listening in. Till next week, remember the content is king and the control of your content is in your hands. Thank you for listening to the Broadcasters Podcast. Find all the links to subscribe to the show by going to broadcasterspodcast.com. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program, The Wrestling Is Real Podcast, exclusively at wrestlingisreal.com.